Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to, uh, to come to this, uh, I hope, to be a debate about the, uh, the issue I'm going to speak about, the crisis of contemporary Islamic discourse in the Middle East. What I mean by contemporary Islamic discourse is the dominant discourse. The discourse you can see everywhere in the media, especially in the media, in satellites, on TV programs, on some mosques. Uh, this is what I mean by Islamic discourse. I don't mean the intellectual Islamic discourse that could present a different meaning or different way of thinking. This is beside my lecture here. Because I found this dominant Islamic discourse very, very, very powerful and very, very influential. I mean, an example to show its, uh, its impact. A couple of years ago in Egypt, the issue of headscarf was debated, disputed. There was no agreement about whether it is an essential part of religious obligation or not. Now, this month, it has become already established as a religious obligation. The debate now is not so much on headscarf, it's on burqa, on niqab. So how far in a couple of years this dominant Islamic discourse was able to infiltrate, to penetrate the society. So there is some influence here that need the attentions of intellectuals to study this discourse. Uh, my lecture will be decided according to this to Islam. When exactly and why Islam, religion in general, Islam specifically, became the only frame of reference to these societies. Because this is the foundational issue. And then when and how and the state claimed Islam that became part of every constitution that Islam is the religion of, of the state. And this led to the third point, oppositional Islam versus the official Islam, because now we have the official Islam of the state and the oppositional Islam of the political opposition. And what is, what, what is involved here is so many essential concepts, communality versus individuality. Individuals are not, are not that important as they should be. It's only the community. And the, 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 the point of the duty-bound in, in individual, this is the, the basic concept of Sharia. The human being is duty-bound, not right-bound. The scope of available freedom in the Middle East and the conclusion. So let's start with the. Okay. All right. It's working. Let's start with the crisis of modernity, because this is, the found, this is what is behind the scene that is not unseen in most of the studies about the development of Islamic discourse from the 18th century to the 19th century to the 20th century. The crisis of modernity, modernity came as a surprise to the, to the Muslim world. It came with the colonial power. So it has been connected to this power. But within this power, there was a question in the 19th century and the 20th century that accepted modernity on the condition of being in accordance with the Islamic values. So the first answer to modernity is to accept modernity, but to modernize Islam, to produce a modern understanding, a modern outlook of Islam. We can mention some names. I don't want to worry you by, by, by names. So the first response was modernization of Islam. This went on until 
Well, let's, let, let, let me put it this way, 1924, the abolishment of Khilafat in Turkey. It's a very, very important moment in the history of modern Islamic societies. From that moment, identity became a, a catastrophe, a problematic. Who are we? I mean, after the, Kimel, the, the, the Kimelids, you know, decided to be, for Turkey to abolish Khilafat and for Turkey to be uh, uh, a secular republic. So the question of re-establishing Khilafat became a crucial question. Of course, it failed because all the Arabic rules, kings, wanted to be the new caliph. So it didn't work. But people, people I mean, the majority of Muslims was left like naked people, naked of the unifying, unifying identity. And if you remember, just in 1928, in Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood was established as a response to this dilemma. So much have been done in the secularization of the Egyptian society. So the cry of the early Muslim Brotherhood document was how to retear this society into Islam again. So now it's Islamization of modernity. So if the, if the answer to the challenge was yes, we need to develop, we need to be modern, and we need to rethink our tradition in order to be modern. The, 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 the response after the Khilafat abolishment became no, we need to return to our Islam. So this is, seems response to the same question, but it provides absolutely different opposite answer that we are so far away from Islam. We are not Muslims anymore. So this is the basic point behind Islamization of modernity. You can find this in Abu al al maududi discourse in India, in Sayyid Qutb in Egypt in the early 50s. So Islamism became the motto of the Muslim brothers. But we have to understand Islamism and we have to understand all this cry to returning back to Islam as a response to an already process that is the, of, of secularization that it could not be, you know, uh, turn it back. So there's something that happened on the ground and this something what happened on the ground making those groups angry. So the, the is Islamism, Muslim Brotherhood, the movement of Islamism returning back to Islam became very, very strong. But until very recently, the, 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 the form and the version of Islamism was very moderate. I mean, also I don't want to take you to all these theological schools. It was an Ash'arism theology. Ash'arism is something moderate if compared to Wahhabism. But since the 70s, Islamism became strong, Wahhabism became very, very influential by so many channels, including monies, came in, provided to Egypt, which became, have so many economic problems after the wars. I mean, 1948, 1967, 1973, and all those Egyptians and all those Arabs going to the Gulf area looking for uh, a reasonable job, reasonable salary, most of them return it back, most of them, not all of them, was brained, believing that this form of Islam is the form of divine blessing. This is what brought all this, you know, oil all this money. So those people are rich because they are very good Muslims. So if you'd like to be rich, we should have a very, be a very good Muslims as well. Well, there is something here I would like to add. The concept of making wealth of something in the ground, oil. You don't have to work to be rich if you have oil. You don't have 
even have to dig. You can hire someone to dig for you, bring the oil, and you get rich. Very much the Islamic discourse is built on this strategy. Everything is in the past. Every solution is there. You can just open the page of the book and bring the answer. You don't have to think. If you can understand this parallelism between the production of wealth and the production of idea, you can understand the dilemma of the Middle East in a very, in a very you know, simple and brief way. After the domination of the Wahhabi ideology, terrorism. Terrorism started in my lovely country. It did not start somewhere, but it started in my, in my lovely country. Within the 11 September problem, we can, we can watch another you know, apologetic Islam. Apologetic means, well, it's not only Islam that is aggressive, but also Christianity was aggressive. Judaism is aggressive. So there's nothing peculiar about terrorism in Islam. Apologetic Islam is trying to explain Islam as a peaceful, as wonderful, as nothing wrong with Islam, but everything is wrong with the mentality of Muslims. So it's another, another way of saying something that try to justify in a mysterious way what is going on. So it's not Islam. Islam is, is free of this. And sometimes when I hear those people speak, they speak about Islam as they imagine it existed in the mind of God. Not Islam as understood by people and practiced by human beings. This is the, how religion became the only frame of reference. The state have decided to claim, to claim Islam. Okay. Islam is the official religion of the state. You can find it in almost all constitutions. There is some exceptions, but I'm not fully aware of the exceptions. And according to the discussion, this was in 1924, when Egypt was about to formulate its first constitution. And the committee to formulate the constitution have this debate whether we should mention Islam as a religion of Egypt or just leave it. And paradoxically, the Coptic member of the committee expressing their trust in their Muslims co-citizens said there is no harm because the majority of Egyptians are Muslim. One of our thinkers afterwards say it was full of harm. And it is full of harm. And it is something that it is still there. The modern constitution of Egypt is mentioning so many conflicting, conflicting you know, articles, like Islam is the religion of the state, Sharia, and this is the second point, Sharia is the main source, or the principles of Sharia is the main source of legislation. And in the meantime, the constitution is forbidding making any political party on religion. And this is, you know, this is a paradox. I mean, the state is taking Islam as the official religion, taking Sharia as the source of legislation, and the Muslim Brotherhood are saying the same. So why, what is the logic here behind, behind that? Sharia, whether it is the principles of, is the main, or one source of legislation, is also something that is there. That's why in any issue, especially issues that is connected to family law, marriage, divorce, inheritance, whatever, the government cannot make issue any law without consultation with the religious institution. And it depends if the religious institution at that moment is liberal or it is conservative. 
When it comes to women issue, it is always conservative. And I would explain why. The family law, there is no Sharia court in Egypt, for example, but there is the, 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 family, the family court which is ruled by Sharia, which means it is a Sharia court without having the name Sharia, Sharia court. I cannot, I can tell so many stories about how the Sharia court uh, functioned in condemnation of people, in giving women hard, hard time to get divorced from a failure, a, a failed marriage. But in the year 2000, I think there was an attempt to change the law, to give women the right to divorce. This was called khulla. Law, I don't know, you don't have to understand the word khulla and how it was very offensive to male arrogance. Khulla it means taking things out and throwing it away. So the reaction to this law was extremely oppositional. All the males of the Egyptian society was very angry from the law because of its name. But anyway, the government wanted to have, to have this law accepted by the, by the uh, religious institution, Al-Azhar, or the ulama, etc., etc. And if you follow the debate about this law, you got, I got crazy at that time of all these people trying to find certain president, the prophet have told someone, some woman wanted to get divorced, she went to the prophet and said, I don't like this man, he is fine, but I don't like him. And the prophet said, well, okay, give him back the, the, the garden he gave to you. And then he ordered the man, or he asked the man, or he advised the man. The problem was whether the prophet ordered the man or advised the man. Because if it was an order, then the judge has the right to issue divorce. If it was advice. So the entire debate was about what is exactly the intention of the prophet. Was an order or was an advice? At the end of the day, the law is issued, but a right you don't pay for your right to have it. Women have to pay to get the right of divorce. So te technically, legally, it is not right. If I have to pay something to get something, then this something that I get because I paid the, the price is not right. But anyway, they called, the law gave the women right to divorce, which again is, you know, playing with words. What is the constitutional cit citizen equality? It's rhetorical. If the, if, if the state has a religion, then how can we imagine equality between citizens? Some of them belong to the religion of the state, and some of them belong to another religion which is not the religion of the state. Unfortunately, and I'm very, very sad to say so, the Copts of Egypt became more under the authority of the church. They don't belong to the state. They don't find protection in the state. They find protection under the Pope, under Schnuda, uh, whatever, whatever it is. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's really bleeding how a country like Egypt became divided and, and people, the Egyptian people, are fighting each other. You, you find a lot of stories. I don't want to go to these stories. Constitutional freedoms are rhetorical because all, every article in the Constitution talks about freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of religion. It's under the Sharia. And when everything is put under the Sharia, it's meaningless. So at the end of the day, someone would say, this is again it's Sharia. So all these kind of freedom that are put in the Constitution does not really have any, 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 any effect on the ground. And we will see how, is, uh, how this kind of, uh, of freedom 
is expressed in the media in Egypt, for example. I'm, I'm always taking, taking examples of Egypt, but Egypt just represent the entire area. Changing religion, religion is a catastrophe. You cannot change your religion. You cannot take a decision if you are a Muslim to be a Christian or a Christian to be a Muslim. It's not only the state to stand, but the entire society would stand against that. And we have so many stories about this catastrophic position when people decide to change their religion. I'm not going to the detail about whether it is possible or not to remove from our IDs, from our, no, it's not in the passport, from our Egyptian IDs, the identity of religion. But even if it is removed, you will be known by your name. Because in the last 20 years, people have been very keen to identify themselves according to their names. When I was a young man, the names that cannot be identified as Christian or Muslim was, was many, was the rule. Now it's very easy that you can identify the person by his or her name. Changing religion is impossible, so the freedom of religion is rhetorical. It's on paper. On the Oppositional Islam versus the official Islam. I have to go far. The emergence, the emergence of radicalism everywhere. Of course, after all these development, radicalism became obvious everywhere, not only in Egypt, but of course, even in Saudi Arabia. There were Wahhabi radicals against the royal family. They they condemn the royal family because they are not Wahhabi enough, because they, they betray the Wahhabi, the Wahhabi principles. Condemnation of infidelity became general practice in, 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 in daily discussion. You are kafir, which means you are not a Muslim anymore. This opinion is kufr, infidelity. So it became like, like, like everyday life. If people are making it very easy. Of course, the state, is, employ is, is employing the same strategy, condemnation of people because, because they have different opinion. Kufr, infidelity, became a sign to silent whoever have, has different, different opinion about any, about any issue. Not only religious issue, because all the issues in the discussion became theologized, very much like here. Any issue, if you, if you catch a Moroccan boy, you know, stealing something, you make it a theological issue. It has nothing to do with the boy, it has, not, yes, it has to do with Islam. So everything has been theologized. It's not only here, but also in, in, the, in the Middle East. So every issue from the very detailed life has been theologized and people ask a question and this is, you know, the... The, 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 the market of fatwa. Sometimes I feel because people are asking questions that never people asked 20 years ago. And you think those people suddenly realize that they, they, they don't understand their religion. Radicalism became everywhere. Accusation of Kof became everywhere. Cry for the immediate implementation of Sharia, ah, especially the Hudud, especially the penal code. Cutting the hand of the thief, lashing women, lashing or stoning women, etc., etc. Of course, it is not in every Muslim country, but in Yemen it is there, in some parts of Yemen. In Iran, it is there. And then cleansing the public space. The public space should be clean from the others. The others could be the other religious, could be women. Women back home or cover your body. It's amazing. You see how women are really covered. I mean, after the Borga became the disputed case, everything has changed. 
Of course, the question is now in Egypt whether it is possible in public space to have a burqa or not. So, of course, you can defend this on human rights basis, but you should not defend it on a religious basis. More religiosity in the state institutions. In Ramadan, the, the sacred marks of Muslim, go to any government office to do some work, people are praying, making line in the hall of the ministry or in the hall of the office, and they are praying. Go to have a ticket to the train, and the person is not there, he is praying. You have to miss your train because he is praying, and you cannot, you know, uh, object. Because this, you, had, you will be condemned as kafir. You, have, you, you go to the, to, well, it happened with me, I mean, going to take injection, and the lady doctor told me, I don't give injections to males. I said, but you are a doctor. She said, yes. I said, I'm not a male. I'm a patient. It's different. And if you have a male body, you are not going to check. He's a body, not a male or, fe or female. It's, it's increasing, this experience, what, which I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm just explaining. More religiosity in the street. Mosques are full of people. And sometimes they block uh, the, uh, uh, the passage of, of the cards. But in the meantime, corruption is everywhere. And everyone is asking this question. How come that is very religious society and very corrupted society in the meantime? Religiosity void of any ethical or spiritual content. People are very keen to go to the mosque, but in practical life they can cheat. This kind of religiosity, which, which is very, very obvious, in again, I'm talking about Egypt, but it is everywhere. I can listen to similar story from my friends everywhere. In this Sharia-oriented society, the individual corrupted West is presented. And on all these fatwas, I mean, I have been reading so many fatwas now, uh, just before I came to, uh, it's amazing about everything is haram. Sitting in a chair is haram because it is produced in the West. And if you sit on the chair, you will, you know, appreciate the people who invented the chair. But if you sit on the floor, you appreciate the God who created the earth. Individual freedom under Sharia is rhetorical. Blasphemy, accusation of blasphemy against fine art, visual art. So many artists has been prosecuted because they painted. Statues became haram. I mean, Egypt is a country of temples and statues. Of course, you could not touch these statues, but it is haram on the discourse level. On the discourse level, it is haram. It is forbidden. Poetry, people are persecuted because they published a poem or a collection of poems. And literary narratives, novels, short stories, okay. Any sentence, and there was a big fuss in Egypt about a novel that caused Egypt to be busy for six months and the Egyptian parliament was busy about this novel for six months with all the problems in Egypt. Heresy became a very easy allegation against different religious interpretation. Even if you are a Muslim and you have different religious interpretation, then this is heresy. Apostasy against free thinkers. The others as enemies, Copts, Non-Muslims, if you are in a Sunni, if you are in a Sunni country, then Shi'is are the others. If you are in a Shi'i country, Sin Sunnis are the other. Of course, the Baha'is are the others everywhere. The Ahmadis, 
They are persecuted everywhere, even in Indonesia lately. They have been persecuted and their headquarters have been burned. Of course, the Alevis, I mean, don't, don't, don't mention something about the Alevis. In, uh, although the, uh, the, the Alevis are the ruler of Syria, they belong to this uh, Alevis. But the Alevis themselves, as a religious community, are under persecution. I would like to give the six point some reflection about comparing contemporary Sharia understanding and classical Sharia understanding. I mean, I'm not going anywhere on any free thinking or any new hermeneutics or anything like that. Just, you know, in contemporary Sharia as is, are sets of duties, the right of Allah. In classical Islamic thought, there were some divine duties that God have responsibility to do and uh, to issue what is in the most interest of human being. The entire theory of, of, of the legal theory in, Islam, in classical Islam is based on this interest, the human interest. So God has certain responsibility in classical Islam, but in, in contemporary Islam, Sharia is just a set of duties. There is no place for rights. In contemporary Islam, things are either forbidden, haram, or permitted, halal. Only two categories. In classical categories, there are five. Obligatory, forbidden, recommended, rehensible, and the mubah. So there is more space in the classical concept of human action than we have now that things are either haram and, or, or, or halal. And everything now has been, I mean, I just mentioned, chairs are haram. I mean, look, a cartoon sometimes is haram because it presents a human being. This is against, again, this is art, is haram. Physical punishment, which is demanded by radical groups, hudud. In the history, in, 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 in classical Sharia, the jurist, the classical jurist made it impossible, put conditions to make the, the, the application of this penal code impossible. It's impossible to find four witnesses that have seen the sexual action in details in order to apply Sharia. It's impossible. So the, the classical ulama made it impossible because the entire society was moving to a more civil society that cannot tolerate people just cut hand moving in the street. Now it is, it is demanded, it is done without any condition that is established in classical, in classical Sharia thinking. Well, Sharia, I mean, the, 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 the classical fiqh, the classical uh, jurisprudence have made entirely different ways of interpre interpre interpretation of the Quran. I mean, they made the implementation of the penal code that is mentioned in the Quran impossible. So they upgraded the meaning of the Quran. When it comes to women's rights, they downgraded the meaning of the Quran. Because women's rights is something very, very modern, the 19th century, not before that. So women have minimum rights in classical Sharia. In the discourse, I mean, I'm analyzing, has no, no right. Obedience, absolute obedience to the husband. They have so many ugly statements about the duty of women toward their husbands, toward the family. Well, what is the scope of available freedom? After what I, I, I explained. Economic freedom, yes, green, green light. It's a globalization, free market, yes. 
But corruption, yes, of course. Because economic freedom, as Lizzie Passé, Lizzie Fair, is not based on the freedom of the human being. It is based on the freedom of the rich, of the new rich. The gap between poor and the new rich is amazing. So there is economic freedom, but what is the impact of this economic freedom on the daily life of people in the Middle East? Nothing. They are starving. Society, not of social solidarity, but society of sadaqah, of giving almas. I mean, this is uh, political freedom. Yeah, yellow light, not green light. You are free to criticize the government, to criticize this minister or that minister. You can do whatever you say. Kings, princes, presidents are immune. Red light. Don't touch the emir. Don't touch the president. People who touch the president or the emir or the king, they disappear. Just disappear. Freedom of religion, nothing. Red light. Rethinking religious tradition, red light nowadays. It was possible in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. It's not possible now. You can rethink, but within tradition. And you will be braised as a mujtahid if you think within tradition. If you make a choice from different tradition opinion. But if you look to tradition from a critical viewpoint, this is red light. Think of the Quran, boom, explosion. No, that's absolutely nothing, absolutely impossible. Even to say a statement, a very statement like Fadl Rahman have made, while the Quran is the word of God in some sense, but in some sense it's the word of Muhammad. Okay, the man left immediately Pakistan and never returned back. Well, now I come to the conclusion because I think the discussion is more important than... Yeah. <laughs> I am too pessimistic. Is it that dark? Yes. But I cannot give up. I cannot just say it's too dark and just, you know close my door, and go to bed. I am not too pessimistic, because I believe in the future. I believe in the new generation. I believe in the possibility of change. That's what keeps me alive. But I have to also to open my, heart, my eye. On the public space level, this is a real problem. I just explained the impact of this discourse on the public space level. On the public slave place le space level, which I confront with my family. Of course, they love me, they adore me. But they cannot really take my word. I have three women in my family under my authority who are completely covered. I believe in freedom also. When I have any discussion with them, they are convinced. But of course, I am there for some time. I am not the school teacher. I am the, I'm not the mosque preacher. They trust the mosque preacher more than they trust their... Uh, Godfather. On the intellectual private space level, there is a lot of criticism, a lot of debate. Among, you know, there is always this kind of limited space for freedom. It's a long tradition in the history of Islamic thought, this kind of private space where freedom is possible and public space where freedom is impossible. 
I mean, we can we can tell stories from the, uh, the Abbasid uh, dynasty, the other dynasty. The challenge issue to be redressed, and there's something intellectuals have to work on openly. Separation between religion and the state. In Egypt, I made it like a joke. Egyptians love to make jokes about everything. I said, the state does not go to the mosque. The state does not pray. The state does not fast Ramadan. The state does not go to Hajj. The state has nothing to do with religion. The state has to do with the protection of all citizens, of the freedom of all citizens. This should be done, separation between religion and the state, not only on the level of constitution, but on the level of the decision taken by the government. It does not mean separation between religion and the community. It's a different story. You cannot separate religion from the community, but you can separate religion from the state. You can stop the state from using religion for legitimation, constitutional reformation, citizenship based on absolute religious and gender equality. Women are suffering more in, my, in, in our society. Educational reformation to empower individualism. I think these are the challenging issues, of course. This includes so many other issues concern, you know, concerning rethinking tradition, rethinking the meaning of religion, rethinking the Quran, etc., etc., etc. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for an excellent lecture uh, for bringing Islam so close to us, not in the least because you gave such a large part of yourself. Um, I'm sure this gave us all food for thought and food for questions. So I open the floor. Um, you do remember that there's a bonus on short questions, no lectures. Um, after the questions, there will be drinks served. Uh, and there will be two people walking around with mics, so if you would raise your hand, uh, the mic will be coming to you. You're the first. Um, please state your name and um, what organization you represent, if you do, and then ask your question. Yes. I'm Anna Arts. I see uh, enormous uh, interaction between the power of government and the people of Islamic countries and uh, supporting each other with no freedom. I also see uh, that uh, uh, many lies are being lived, that Islamic countries live a lie because people have no freedom of choice. So everybody is Muslim, but that's not true because I know ex-Muslims who, who live in Islamic countries who have to lie all the time that they are Muslims. You know, they just act as if they're Muslims, they're not. And who are married to Muslims, and they, their wives even don't know. I think it is horrific. What do you think about this? Yes, so what do you think about this? Do you think that Islamic countries live a lie by oppression, by, by enforcing people to be Muslims? Yeah, I, I, I think he, I, I made it clear that uh, this kind of... Uh, there is no space for freedom, would immediately lead to a society of uh, hypocrisy. That you cannot really express yourself. You have to pretend that you are what you are not. So this, this is a phenomenon that people can have freedom in private space, but in public space, they do have to prove themselves as different persons. Yeah. Good evening, Johanna Kons. Do you think it's at all possible to... Can you please uh, put the microphone closer? Do you think it's at all possible to have a proper Islam in a proper democracy? Popular? Proper Islam in a proper democracy. 
whatever oh, yeah, yeah, might yeah. be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I understand you. I, I think, I think democracy is uh, well. Um, if, if if it is really established on its uh, con constituent like freedom, because there are democracies in the Arab world. Eh? There are elections. There are parties. Okay, so this is democracy without democrat, democracy without freedom, because democracy, as far as I understand, it's one vote, one person. But this person should be free to, to vote. So if democracy, based on freedom that is established in society for the freedom to make decision, male and female, well, Islam could live with that. I mean, Islam have lived and uh, and survived from tribal society of Mecca and Medina to uh, empires, okay, the Umayyad, the Abbasid Empire, and then to the nation state and globalization. I mean, it's, it's a, so I don't see any, any kind of uh, opposition or contradiction between having a democratic society and people living according to their Islamic values. Uh, my name is Fons Elders. Um, Alma Nusair from the Al Azhar University has been pointing out what she calls the miserable Middle East and analyzing quite profoundly the role of the Western powers and also the establishment of the State of Israel and the very uh, tough consequences for the Arab countries and the oil you mentioned yourself. So you have been describing a kind of pattern which is evolving more and more towards this kind of closed society. But I'm curious about the role that the West has been playing and perhaps even more after the so-called decolonization as before. Because otherwise we will leave this room thinking it is all to blame on them while it is my study and research is guiding me more into the opposite direction. We are part of this crisis. And I mean with we, you know, you know what I mean, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well I do agree, I mean I mean, analyzing the, the crisis of modernity, which I just, you know, made it very, uh, very fast, because it needs another lecture, okay? The crisis of modernity have brought uh, that the, the Muslim world, since then, since the 18th century, is unable to develop according to its internal dynamic. And this is different from the reformation that happened in the Christian Christian society in the Middle Ages. Okay, there is always some in external power interfering in this debate, reforming or reinforming this, uh, this debate. If, if I would like to explain this kind of terrible discourse, I cannot exclude the present situation in the Middle East, the present situation where the situation in Iraq, the situation in Palestine, the unsolved problem in Palestine. So all these, you know, uh, all these context play in encouraging and discouraging, you know, certain certain version of understanding. Uh, from the 18th century, Europe has been there. Now Europe and America are there. Very soon, China and Japan will be there. Uh, but sometimes you. You have also to think about why people are unable to work with this power, because in this modern world you cannot, you know, think of an isolated, an isolated world. Is. There are so many decisions uh, that have been taken by the West that negatively affected, negatively affected the development of a modern understanding and interpretation of Islam, because it's very easy. To, to condemn 
any modernizing process by, 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 by claiming it as westernization. Okay, so there is a responsibility here. Politicians in both sides don't work according to the interest of the people. Politicians in the West, in the Middle East, they have short-sighted vision. They don't look to the future. They look to the next election. So I think there is, there, there is certain responsibility. But there is certain responsibility on, on intellectuals in both sides to apply critical discourse for both cultures, because what we think diff two cultures is not really as we imagine two separate different cultures. The history can show us this kind of interaction all the time from, from the very beginning, from the 7th and 8th century until now, with its positive and, and negative influence. So there is positive influence and negative influence for this kind of interference, but definitely I do agree with that. I, 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 I do not get deep into this because I have written about that. I mean, the book that was, uh, you know, uh, financed by WRR is about reformation in, uh, in, uh, in of Islamic thought. It's free on the, on, on the internet, you can download free. Uh, I, I dealt with this issue. The, the, the West and the Muslim world uh, confusing relationship from the 18th century until now. It is still very confusing. I saw somebody there, yeah. Hello. Um, do you think there will be a time in which we will re return to the um, uh, cl classical Islam? The classical discourse, as you mentioned before. Well, I wouldn't really go for classical Islam or classical discourse. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, a modern, 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 modern Islam to go forward, not to go backward. Because those great, our great ancestors have presented their understanding according to their own historical context. That we are living in different contexts. We have more dramatic questions that we have to deal with. And if women suffered in the past, they should not suffer in the present. So classical Islam is a subject of a scholarship, not a model to return back. And this is the cry of, of fundamentalism, to return back to, to, classical, to classical Islam. But of course, classical Islam is not monolithic Islam. I mean, you can retain it back to rational, rational classical Islam, and you can retain it back to traditional uh, Islam. Sorry, yeah? Small explanation. Well, I didn't mean Coming actually up. really fundamentalistic uh, form of uh, Islam, but I meant uh, the more um, at ease part of the Islam. Yeah, so yeah, I understand that. Having a more... Of course, you didn't, you didn't, no, you didn't. No, I'm not, surely not a fundamental. <laughs> this I understand, but for me, for me as a scholar, both are classical. Maybe I learn more from rational theology, from philosophy, Averroes, etc., etc. But it's not to imitate. Ibn Rushd, a great philosopher of the 12th century, the great commentator of Aristotle, the, the wonderful philosopher whom I occupy the chair named on his name, lived in the 12th century. Okay, I learn from Averroes, but I don't imitate Averroes because I live in the 21st century. This is, I need to learn from Averroes as well as to learn from Ibn Taymiyyah, for example. I mean, this is all my heritage that I need to have conversation with. Okay, not to divide classical Islam into some beautiful Islam and some ugly Islam. Well, this, is, this is all my past with its beauty, with its ugliness. I have to deal with it from a historical critical uh, view rather than to go back to imitate uh, or to copy. Hi, Professor. Um, for example, in the 12th century, you had Imam Razi in his Tassil al uh, famous Quran commentator, saying, for example, that um, when it comes to beliefs and rituals... Uh, Razi, you mean? Imam Razi... Uh, Razi. Razi. 
Resi. Resi, now. And um, for example, he said that um, when it comes to religion, beliefs, and rituals, it's between God and the person himself. And the person and Islamic law judges cannot comment on it or do anything about it. And only when the rights of other humans are interfered, then the judges will come in. This is, of course, a really secular statement, and it was known in Islamic law. It's repeated in Islamic classical Islamic law. Even Rush is considered the father of secularism by Western scholars. So it's, it's always interesting that, for example, now fundamentalists try to distinguish uh, modern, Western modernism and at the same time reject um, these classical statements as being different and both are kefir. But how do they distinguish this? If, for example, they see secularism as Western, but at the same time it's already part of their heritage. How do they confront this uh, contradiction in their own statements? Yeah, I think, I think it's very easy. I mean, if I just uh, put myself in a... Uh, it's, it's very easy. What, what you mentioned as secularism could not be taken as real secularism because all these decisions of making distinction between personal duty toward God and the legal aspect, well, this was a decision taken by rulers. So at the end of the day, it's a ruler who is making religious decisions. So very much like, like in Ma'moon in the episode. So it, we cannot say that it's really secular. Secular means the ruler has nothing to do with any religious decision. He is responsible for political decision, economic decision, social decision, and he is responsible in front of representation of the people. This is a very, very modern concept. Okay? This did not exist. Whether in India, there are wonderful examples in the history of India about, about, about people who were you know, more, more thinking in terms of a universal religion, not even a limited, a limited religion, Islam or Christianity or thing. But this, it, this great example, still examples that existed within the paradigm of religious empires, that the decision was in the hand of the, the, the emir or the caliph or the sultan or, or whatever, which is not the same as what we think about secularism now. La the, 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 the lady in black, I would almost say. Good evening. Uh, I would like to ask you if you are also looking to the developments in Turkey, as we are discussing the Middle East, but uh, Turkey is now um, trying to play um, a bigger role in, in the Middle East. For example, the uh, developments of the AK Party in Turkey as a... Of the, of the AK Party, the, the, the party of uh, Mr. Yeah. Erdogan, who is now changed itself into a more conservative party instead of a, a, a pure religious party. Uh, does that, uh, is an example for people in the Middle East to look up to, or is that something that, how is that discussed uh, according to you in the Middle East, these developments in Turkey? Well, it's, I, 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 don't, I don't see it as, as, as development. I see it as a returning back to the Gitu. Uh, if, 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 I, if I understood your question correctly, uh, because my, my hearing is not really that good, uh, uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's people are getting more and more uh, imprisoned in their identity, especially a religious identity, and losing their national identity. Even those who are not very religious among the Copts, they suffer from what is going on on the ground, and they, they act on the same manner of being imprisoned in their identity as a Copt, whether they are religious or not. I always have, have, uh, have you know, meeting with Copts in Egypt and Copts who are living in the Netherlands. And uh, I always try to persuade them, don't get into this kind of uh, uh, minority, mentality psychology, because this is very dangerous. Okay, you have all the right to participate in public space, in politics. Uh, don't, leave, don't leave the space for those who are radical. This is, uh, 
But the situation is, is really uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't sound good for me. Uh, in the meantime, the, the Coptic church, I mean, the clerk, are more conservative than the Muslim, than the Muslim ulama. Uh, I, I just explained when this khulla law, because it's made for all Egyptian, the Pope said, well, any, any Coptic woman who get divorced according to the khulla law, the church would not recognize this divorce. So this, so, so the, the national law does not really, is not taken seriously by, 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 by the Pope. So there is, what? Well, there is, there is implicit two states in Egypt, the Pope and the President. Of course, the Pope, Pope Shenouda, support the President, giving his position to his son, openly and publicly. You don't understand how those people think. Do they answer your question? No. I, I answered something else. So I didn't hear your question. Well, please, I mean. Uh, maybe I try again and let me look if we can communicate. Uh, I was just wondering if what's happening in Turkey. In the, Turkey. In Turkey. Yes. In uh, Ankara. Uh, yes. Is, uh, is that, how is that discussed? The, the, the race of uh, a party that was um, seen first as a religious party now transferred itself in a very short time to what they say a conservative party, but a party from the masses. Is that something that is among the debate uh, in the Middle East? Is that an example? Uh, could in you Egypt. probably elaborate a little bit on that? Is it somewhere part of the debate? How do you look at that uh, development in Turkey in the rest of the Middle East? Well, I can, I, I can understand this. I mean, I mean, Turkey has been under, you know, enforced secularism from 1924 until now. So probably this secularism has Im infiltrated the society and therefore created this acceptance of the separation between the state and religion and allow it for a party to be formed according to religion. And you know, you know how many problems this, uh, this, this party have gone through to be solved and then uh, again and again again. They have succeeded in doing something that uh, Islamic parties in the Middle East are unable to do. They have already made the separation between the office of da'wah of preaching and the office of politician. So they have expert politician. When they make you know, nomination to the parliament, they get really people who are invested in politics. And they leave the da'wah for the, the shaykh, the, the preachers. Okay. In the case in the Middle East, it's, it's different. I mean, Hamas, for example, Haniya is a good preacher but he's not a politician. A Muslim Brotherhood, until now, they bring, nominate some members, they are in the parliament, they have no experience of being politicians. In the parliament, they give preaching. They cite the Quran, they cite the Hadith in the parliament. So, so far, the, the, the Turkish experience is not taken seriously by the the, the Islamic movement in the Middle East, maybe, because they think they are Arabs. They understand better, Islam better, than, the, than those Turks. So still, yeah, I, I mean, there is a lot, a lot of debate. Why don't you accept this? I mean, uh, it has been accepted by Turks. They don't really look to, to what going, uh, going on in Turkey as, uh, in a positive sense. Do they answer your question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have a gentleman here and then one over there. Unless your question regards this answer or not? No? Okay, then. My name is Chris Leimann. 
I have a, a question that may sound uh, very silly because I uh, always look at things uh, from reverse angles. Uh, you you, ma you men mentioned uh, those people. I, I forgot the, uh, the, the, the the way of thought uh, they uh, belong to. Was it Wahhabi? I'm not sure. Yeah, with, 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 with regard would regard a chair like that, Haram. I wonder would they all, uh, uh, also. Uh, reverse uh, things and uh, consider the money uh, they, uh, they obtain from uh, non-Muslims uh, haram. Uh, I mean the, the oil, uh, uh, the, the, the money they receive for oil or for uh, uh, freeing hostages uh, they, 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 they had taken or whatever. Uh, could, you, could you tell me a bit about uh, yeah, this reverse angle uh, in uh, Regarding Haram, please. Thank you. <laughs> well, I can tell you some, some fatwas, but... <laughs> I mean, some fatwas that I have read. I mean, <laughs> any money you get from, from, from non-Muslims is halal. <laughs> okay? Whether you work for it... Or you better don't work for, for non-Muslims. You just <laughs> steal his money. Uh, and it's halal because... Uh, uh, these are fatwas that, that, uh, that are there. I mean, if you, if, you, if you belong to this, you know, terrorist group, and then you take for, ask for ransom to free a hostage, well, for, for them it's halal. It's money from the infidels. Okay, so, so if, if, if you go to this, you know, thing, so, uh, everything could be halal and everything could be haram. It, 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 it depends on on where, where you are. Uh, yeah, but, but also some, some groups in Egypt, they can, you know, uh, boot, you know, the shops of the courts and say, this is halal, they can take it. Uh, but of course, I mean, if you go to classical Islam, I mean, even very, very traditional classical Islam, and this is not halal, this is haram, this is stealing. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense for a traditional faqih, whom you steal from. Hello, my name is Kemal Esaban from uh, Rotterdam. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, you talked about the crisis of uh, contemporary Islamic discourse in the Middle East, and I was uh, wondering if there's a difference between the, the Middle Eastern uh, discourse and the discourse of Muslims living in the West. Uh, because they have more freedoms here. Do you see any, any positive uh, things? Uh, well, I'm not aware of, uh, of, 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 of the of, of Islamic discourse in the West that is, uh, you know, preached in the mosques or something like this. I'm aware by people who write books like, you know, Tariq Ramadan, Muhammad Arkun, and other people. And I think those people are trying to do something, you know, different. But I'm not aware of the daily you know, uh, daily uh, discourse that exists among Muslims or exists in mosques or in community because first I don't speak Dutch, I don't understand Dutch. So it's a failure in my, in my side to, uh, to know that. Secondly, there is no public space like the, uh, the satellite uh, in, uh, in the Middle East where they hire all those uh, people that can speak all this kind of nonsense Islam and get paid for that. Because there are a lot of money invested in uh, propagating this, uh, this discourse in the Arab world. I mean, if you, if you understand Arabic and if you follow satellite, uh, you can find among uh, every 10 uh, channels, at least 70 channels, talking day and night about the Quran, about Islam, and the meaning, what is haram and what is halal. I'm not aware of that. Uh, I got across uh, some, uh, some uh, websites uh, from Amsterdam. Uh, but the surprise was this, they show a video of a sheikh from Egypt. So the discourse is coming from Egypt with a Dutch subtitle. So for me, this is a, a Dutch discourse or, or an Egyptian discourse. 
And in, in, in our global time, we cannot really think of any kind of separation that we cannot imagine an absolutely different discourse that can be presented. There is always the impact of the what's coming on from, coming from the, uh, the Muslim world or the Arab world. Yet. My name is Elisabeth uh, van Hooft. I just coming back from Iran. I noticed a quite a vivid uh, discourse between the civil uh, society. And uh, although it's not public, it's more, you know, uh, they have a strong oral tradition. And I think, uh, the, I think there's some hope, some hope, mm. because everything sounds so negative uh, tonight. I think there's quite some hope for some liberaliz liberalization there. Yeah. And don't you think uh, there's a difference between what's public and public mentioned and written, and what is going in between the lines within the civil society, because that's even more important, I think, for, yeah. for changes. Yeah. Yeah, I understand there is something going on in Iran which is not the same as in, uh, in other Arabic uh, Middle Eastern countries. There is more dynamic uh, civil society uh, debate and discussion. There are more even liberal uh, religious discourse among the uh, the mullahs, there are so many mullahs whom I know that have get, take, took off the uniform in order to be free. Uh, Shia tradition has more free uh, space of debate and discussion than in the Sunni. Although the Shia there is a hierarchy and the Sunni there is no hierarchy, but it's different. Simply because the Shia tradition never was disconnected from philosophical discourse. Teaching in the Hawza, whether it was in Najaf in Iraq or uh, Qum in Iran, uh, based in a real study, real scholarship, uh, study of philosophy, uh, mathematics, uh, physics, uh, etc., etc. Uh, these are not really uh, uh, continuation in the, Sunni, in the Sunni tradition. So there is some hope, uh, but not from the Arab world. And there is some luck here. The Arabs are the minority Muslims in the world now. They are not the majority. Maybe they have the loud voice. Uh, but the majority of Muslims are non-Arabs, whether we speak about Persian or you know, Asian, Asian people. And there are more debate uh, of liberal thinking uh, in Indonesia, for example, than you find in the Arab world. The problem is that the Arab world does not feel the need to understand what is going on in Iran. I mean, there is no translation from Farsi to Arabic. There is no translation from Turkish to Arabic. There is no translation from Bahatha to Arabic. But there are translation to all these languages from Arabic. So in fact, there is a possibility of a change. And this I, 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 I realized in my study. But it is the voice of change is coming from outside the Arab world. But of course, Iran, I mean, Iran, the civil society in Iran needs a lot of support. Because when Khatami, and here is the West, when Khatami, when the reformation was in power, you know what Mr. Bush have done to the system, to put the entire system, reformation system of Iran, within the, um, the evil uh, camp. So there is here the, the responsibility of not realizing something that you should encourage. So this came Ahmadinejad. And Ahmadinejad is persecuting everyone, almost everyone. But people are struggling. And it's something wonderful in Iran. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Um, I had some points. Oh, my name is Raja. I'm a student of Arabic at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. Um, I wanted to say that I thought that the Islamization in Egypt is um, um, actually thanks to the, not only the Muslim Brotherhood, but to the Islamic parties that they, um, they started to Islamize the, the society with their money. 
They had money enough to build hospitals, and the hospitals of the Muslim Brotherhood, etc., were good hospitals. So, of course, the poor people went to those hospitals and to their schools, etc. So the money, um, um, yeah, they started to. Um, oh my God, where's my English gebleven? To uh, make propaganda or something for their um, way of thinking with their money. So I thought it's logical to get this um, kind of development. The same is what we see with the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia. They, they can pay, they have the black gold, so they can pay for their thoughts to spread all over the world, and that's what, what's happening. So it's, it's logical when, when, when you go to a, b a poor uh, group of people and you give uh, with your money, you start to, um, yeah, to, to, to share with them. <laughs> And yeah, to buy them actually. So they start to think um, in the same way you think. So actually, it's, I think it's a normal, um, it's a logical happening. But I think you, you, um, yeah, you give us a picture. Uh, what's really, um, I don't know how to say it in English, but zwart-wit, black-white. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I miss something because uh, it's actually it's. It's not that simple. There are a very um, a great amount of people in the Middle East and in the West uh, which are progressive Muslims. But we don't see them, we don't hear a lot of them, uh, about them. Because the rich Muslims, the Wahhabis, and these kinds of groups, they get the voice and they get the channels on TV and they get all the attention. And I think we have the problem, also the Muslims in the West, the progressive Muslims in the West, we have the same problem as the Muslim intellectuals in the West. We don't get enough attention. So what, what is your opinion about well, this? Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, mean I, I, I mentioned from the very beginning that I'm dealing with the most uh, dominant, uh, obvious uh, discourse that is given, you know, the, the space of satellites and TV, etc., etc., etc. I did not exclude the existence of, you know, opposite discourse. Uh, so it is there, uh, it does, but it does not have the same position in the media. And it does not, does not have the same impact on, uh, on the public. Uh, you mentioned something about money, how, how people are using their money to help other people, etc., etc. Yeah, that's true. Uh, when, when governments, when regime withdraw from doing their duty, from building hospitals, from building schools, from taking care of the citizens. Of course, someone, in, someone has to step in. Uh, from where those people, I mean, got the money? This is a big question, okay? Because with the money they invest in building hospitals, in making schools, they put the rules for whom to be in, in this school, for example. So they put the rule. I visited so many institutions that are, you know, financed by Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and it's it's there. I mean, the uh, the, the propaganda is in everywhere. Okay, so you feel when you enter this, you know, shop, for example, that it's of course it's a shop. It's people are selling and buying, but it's uh, it's it's the, the the ideology is the main concern of the entire the entire activity in. Uh, different discourse, yes, it does exist. Okay, I'm, I'm here presenting this discourse in this very white and black uh, picture. Criticizing it, it means that I am a I am different voice. Otherwise, I wouldn't be very critical of this, uh, of this discourse. Uh, it, does, it does exist, yes, but it's, uh, it's not that effective, unfortunately. It was effective maybe some 20 years ago. So it lost its effect due to the uh, popularity of, uh, of this popular discourse rather than education. Education is not really producing people who can think. People are finding entertain entertainment in watching those people on, on the TV. That's, yeah, it's a, I, I made it, you know, very sharp. Picture. That's why I ask, ask it my question at the end. I am so pessimistic, or not?
Oh, is it uh, may I ask you, is it not dangerous for you to, to, uh, to speak in a such uh, negative way about the Islamic world? And the second thing, uh, I suppose that you are confessing Islamic uh, in, the, in the Islamic religion, and uh, when you are so negative, how can you still support then this, re this religion? Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm critical of, uh, of, of this Islamic discourse, not of Islam. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a different story. I am a Muslim, okay, in my own way of understanding Islam. Okay, I feel powerful enough to leave Islam according to my understanding, not to allow anyone else to enforce on me his or her understanding of Islam. Okay, not, not only because I am a scholar, maybe because it's, this is my life. It's dangerous, yes. But we need to bring some change. And in order to bring some change, uh, we have to make some attempt. Uh, when you are 66 like me, nothing is dangerous. Okay. Everything is like everything. <laughs> Okay, maybe if I were young, even if I, when I was young, I, I, th I think, I don't know, I mean, maybe uh, other people would, would judge me. Okay, because when I was young, I brought up with a different Islam, absolutely different Islam in my village. An Islam who I still dream of seeing it obvious in everyday life in Egypt. That's, that's different. So I'm Muslim, I mean, born a Muslim. So I know that there are so different way of understanding Islam. I have witnessed the, the dramatic change in, uh, in, 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 in Egypt, in, in the Islam of Egypt. I lived this experience. I know exactly when this happened and when that happened. So uh, whatever this discourse I explained, in my view, is not or should not be the only representative of Islam. That's, uh, that's my, my I, and I'm not alone of that. Okay, I assure you that there are, you know, a lot of people uh, in the Arab world and outside the Arab world that are looking for uh, uh, a genuine reformation of this discourse, that this discourse is a disparate discourse. First of which is the gentleman here in front, and then the lady, the second one. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> okay, my, my name is Bert Bom, and my question is, uh, what is the influence of the anti-Islam people discourse in the Netherlands and in the West on the contemporary Islamic discourse in the Middle anti East? Anti-Islam oh, oh, okay. discourse in the Netherlands, in the West, or the anti-Islam people discourse what is the influence on the contemporary Islamic discourse in the Middle East? Well, very, very negative. Very negative. It is used uh, not only to explain that there is some trend, some anti-Islam discourse, but it's, it's, it's presented as this is the West. That the entire West is anti-Islam. So Mr. Wilder's discourse is not taken to present Mr. Wilder's. It's taken to present Holland. And you, you are tired to explain to, to the people that, of course, this, you know, Danish cartoon, that the Danish government could not stop people from expressing themselves. I mean, Mubarak is not the ruler there. So you cannot condemn the government because they cannot stop people because these are values that are highly uh, respected in these societies. So you have to respond to the voice, not to say this is the Dutch or this is the Danish. It's, it's really very positive, yeah. used, manipulated by this discourse. Thank you. The last question, the mic. Thank you, I'm Steffi. Um, I'm wondering, since you still have hope, what do you think is the possibility of change? What is, in your opinion, the best way to achieve the changes you've suggested in the last sheet? <laughs> there is a very simple answer. 
I uh, hear some people say, leave us alone. <laughs> well, of course, I mean, I don't mean it this way. Well, have to find a way to encourage and enhance uh, the voice of reformation, whether it is within European society or within Arabic and Islamic society. How to do this without being politically involved uh, it's a very, very difficult, diff diff difficult way to uh, to, to answer, uh, because the more the more the, the the difficult influence is visible, the more those people who are seeking for reformation are subject to be condemned as Westernization, Westernizing. Okay, so there should be some way uh, to encourage, okay, this movement, but you need, I mean. Uh, yeah, uh, very good politicians, non-corrupted politicians. Unfortunately, the world now is ruled by corrupted politicians all over the world. Obama is an, maybe an exception. That's why all oh, the entire world is looking for a miracle. Because, because a man is, you know, is, is, is honest. Uh, I don't know how, how to do this. I mean, to encourage, to open, I mean, more scholarship to Muslims to study in the West, to study human sciences rather than, you know. Uh, uh, we have a very interesting experience in Leiden. So many students came from, uh, from Al Azhar University, which is a very traditional university, and they studied in Leiden. And they learned beside the traditional knowledge they got from Al Azhar University, they came to Leiden. And with being in, uh, in the, they, they learned the methodology of critical understanding. It's wonderful. Uh, and we have two of those students who are teaching at like, the university right now. This is now blocked for some reason. Okay, so uh, it's not only a political decision to be taken, but you know, this kind of cultural interaction. Uh, having you know, open space to students to visit, to, to people to go to the Middle East and to study. I think this is also one way of you know, uh, helping change. The more, uh, I mean, the, 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 the pioneers of modern Islamic discourse in the 19th and 18th century were people from the institution who studied in the West, in France, in Germany, uh, Belgium, in the Netherlands, and they combined this modern knowledge with traditional knowledge, and they were able to produce you know, what we call reformation. This is stopped uh, for the sake of immediate political interference, immediate, immediate occupation, for example, uh, a, a interference to, to attain immediate political, political end. Uh, but cultural interaction is more important and more, can create more sustainable development than the immediate political or military intervention. But I don't have the, you know, uh, the recipe how to do that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have to end this Q&A session, but I'm sure you can ask more questions when we are having a drink. Um, I would like you to join me in a big round of applause. Thank you very much. start drinking, I would like to thank three more people who've been organizing this evening for you. That's the two people with the mic and the lady in the back. If they can stand up and we give them a round of, round of applause, we can start drinking. Thank you.